I'll be talking much more, I suppose, from an amateurish perspective, just as a, as a clinician who's, who's worked with asylum seekers um, probably since the late 1980s, and uh, so I'll talk in that way. But I probably will talk a bit more about the policy issues as well, even though it's a bit risky for someone like me to do that, but I'll probably give it a go. <clears throat> and apologies to Dave, because he's heard some of this before. Uh, it's, it's an update of a... Of a a speech that I gave to the uh, Refugee Immigration Law Centre um, late last year. So I started off with um, some childhood memories, actually. Um, and um, basically, the issue of drowning. I'd always had a horror of, of, of drowning as a child. And um, in, I remember in, in 1964, when I was in year six at primary school, our teacher, Mrs. Griffiths, would read out loud on Friday afternoon Chapter, chapters from a uh, famous books of the time. And so one example was um, uh, Reach for the Sky by Douglas Bader's life, about his life. And another one was A Night to Remember about the sinking of the Titanic. And uh, this was, uh, as you probably remember, some of you looking around the audience, um, it was made into a, a movie in the late 50s um, starring Kenneth Moore. And obviously more recently, a, a much more famous movie. But one of the things that you, that you might remember is the fate of the steerage passengers who were, who were locked in, mostly Irish, Irish immigrants uh, to America, locked in, and, and, uh, and they all drowned, basically. And I remember having nightmares after watching that movie, and I had a horror of shipwrecks and drowning and, and so on. You're probably wondering why I'm telling you all this, but I'll get to it. Um, so, and I, I had grown up with Irish history and, you know, with, with its uh, tales of the coffin ships full of famine refugees and similar horror stories. Um, and uh, I suppose I could go on in that vein that the history of Australia sort of originates in those sort of things too with convicts, the convict ships and so on. So boat people are very much a part of our history and, and, and the horrors that went with some of those voyages. Um, I came to Australia myself. Um, in the, in the late 60s uh, on a boat um, and uh, as part of a massive queue jumping exercise that Julia Gillard was also part of. Um, my family was detained in Newcastle for several years but um, actually that turned out to be the best years of my life. I, I, I've got to say Newcastle was just a wonderful place to grow up in and it was a great gift to me and my family to, to have come to Australia. The other horror that I remember from childhood was of the great social evil of torture. And my earliest awareness of that evil was watching the 1962 movie Mutiny on the Bounty, in which a seaman played by Richard Harris was brutally flogged by Captain William Bly, um, played by Trevor Howard. And the captain makes the observation to Fletcher Christian, cruelty with a purpose is not cruelty, it's efficiency. So I think that's got some relevance to what we're dealing with in Australia right now. And obviously that was very the, much the, the superficial window into torture, as uh, anyone that's worked in this field knows, uh, much more uh, terrible things happen to people, even as we're speaking right now. So I, I then, skipping a few years, had a chance to make a contribution to the, to the fight against torture in 1986 when, as a newly qualified psychiatrist, I, I learned about the establishment of something called the Medical Foundation for Victims of Torture in London and began with a small group of people which came to include the extraordinary and, and very deeply missed John Gibson, who died um, last year. Some, some people in the audience may know John, um, Victorian barrister. Uh, and first chairperson of the Victorian Foundation for the Survivors of Torture in Melbourne, and Paris Aristotle, who we employed as the first uh, project officer, and then he became the director and did obviously wonderful work in establishing that organisation over, over the last 25 years and more. So it grew under Paris's leadership into Foundation House, and during those years we looked after a lot of refugees um, who almost by definition were torture survivors or survivors of extreme refugee traumas of, of various kinds which were portrayed in David's you know, um, series uh, among other things. So we looked after these as patients, we learned a lot, um, we carried out research in those days and we learned that the social environment was critical for recovery from, from, from the success of the therapeutic efforts and under the right conditions, 
There was incredible resilience to these human beings who you would have thought would never recover from the sort of things they'd actually been through, but they mostly did, mostly did recover in quite spectacular ways in many cases. And I suppose that's been the history of Australia, especially since the Second World War. We've seen that. One of the interesting things as an aside is the failure of, of people who have come here as refugees in that post-war period to actually speak out about this issue. And I sort of wonder why that is the case, you know. And I, was, I was thinking, um, I don't know if you've read Anna Funder's book, All That I Am, about the Jewish situation before the Second World War, where they were turned away from, from very many countries, the, the Jewish refugees. But that's one group we haven't heard a lot from in Australia on behalf of asylum seekers, I don't think, and neither on behalf of other more recent arrival groups who have come through the refugee experience. So it's just a question that maybe people would like to discuss that. Um, okay, so I think, I, th I think, you know, coming back to David's point, it gave you tremendous optimism to see how people could recover from these unbearable experiences. and, and um, and yet one, another thing that we learned was, um, uh, as things went on, that, that even less severe traumas um, inflicted on people within Australia, uh, particularly during the detention experience and asylum seeking experience, that could exert often more devastating effects psychologically than the, 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 the experiences they'd been through in the countries of origin. And this is the phenomenon of, of second injury. You've probably heard of that term. That uh, it, it just looks like, the, looks like the after dinner mint popped into the person's mouth, but it's actually devastating compared to what has actually occurred um, and, and in the past, which they've recovered from. So we've turned in Australia, I think, second injury into an art form. It is just more like third and fourth and fifth injury that we're, we're, in, we're into now these days. So the mental health consequences of torture and trauma, that's probably where I'm on reasonably firm ground, both from research and personal clinical experience. They're, they're very well documented. Um, and uh, you know we know all about this from other groups in, in Australian society too, the Stolen Generation, the char British child migrant stories, and uh, the clerical abuse scandals, and also, I think, military experiences as well. We know a lot about trauma and its effects, and even uh, especially human-inflicted trauma as well. So the effects of severe trauma are very profound. Severe anxiety, um, terrifying nightmares, corrosive depression, a loss of meaning, a loss of purpose in life, um, lateral violence, personality damage, especially in children and young people, which is sort of one of the f key focuses to, to take to try to humanise this debate, to look at the plight of, of uh, young children. And I'll just quote you some figures which um, I just received today, la the latest figures on the number of children in detention, if I can just find them. So the most recent figures are of the 31st of December 2012. There are 1,221 children in locked detention in our, in our system in Australia, in our detention system. 641 of these are on Christmas Island. There are 34 children on Manus Island, in Manus Island Detention Centre. They've got no freedom of movement and they don't go to school. So that's just a, a snapshot. And over the years, you just count up the number of children and adolescents and, that have actually been in in, in detention in Australia over the last decade or, or 15 years or so. so now, I, I, some, I'm somewhat reluctant to emphasise the children because that really makes it sound okay that it's young men and, and other, other people are actually held, held in detention and uh, that somehow as they, they're going to be less damaged, but it's probably true that children are, and young people are going to be more damaged than the rest. And there was pretty good research evidence to support that now. It's how, how do you get these harrowing stories across to the general public? David's talking, just talked very eloquently about that. But the community, many people in the community don't want to hear these stories. And that's true of all abuse and trauma, actually. It's not just, it's not just refugee trauma. It's actually any abused group, whether it was domestic violence or, um, you know, child sexual abuse. Uh, people don't want to hear about suicide. You know? we've, we've been mounting campaigns in recent years to try to get the media to report more, more overtly on suicide, but there's a reluctance by many people to hear these stories, um, not just in the media but in everyday life, because most people can't cope with it. They, they just don't want to... The, the response to trauma is to, is to suppress it, really, in the individual and in the, in the society. So anyway, um, 
the mental mental effects of a punitive immigration policy have have, uh, have been seen, you know, both onshore and offshore. Um, and even those who are not struggling to overcome this burden of mental ill health and personal and social damage, prolonged uncertainty and a flawed, capricious and, and protracted system of determination of refugee status, and anyone that's been in a refugee review tribunal will, will know what I'm talking about there, um, and David certainly does. Um, TPVs, mandatory detention in prison-like conditions, all of these things have inflicted serious additional suffering and manifest harm on thousands of people, many thousands, many of whom, or most of whom, are actually now Australian citizens. So that's the other thing which is often not emphasised in, in these discussions. Um, I've assessed probably 100 or more of the, uh, and looked after them clinically over the last sort of 15, 20 years or so. Um, and as, as I said, there's a strong body of research now which is not challenged by supporters of mandatory detention. They, they say, yes, we know that, but we don't really care about, about, about those facts. And the, uh, yeah, the deterrence approach. So I think it's fair to say that detention centres truly are factories for mental ill health and mental illness. And TPVs operate as a community franchise. So that's just a bit of a very superficial discussion of, of um, it would be a lot better if we could hear some real stories about this, but I'm sure that, that, um, that you've got some understanding of this. So now just to turn to the current shambles that, we de that we're dealing with in this country. Firstly, I want to say that it's possible to, to have differences of opinion here, and one of the potential tragedies of this, of this situation has, um, is that it's placed people of, of, of very high integrity who have made invaluable contributions and indeed saved many lives themselves at odds with each other in relation to what can and should be done. So this splitting of, of, of even of, of our field you know, is, is, a, is something that's happened fairly recently. This is the legacy, therefore, of having politicised and cynically exploited this, this human issue. Many or most in this audience um, and certainly when I talk to the Refugee Immigration Centre people, they're better qualified to, 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 I think, weigh and articulate the moral, ethical and legal issues here. And I think the, this panel is, is very well suited, and Robert's obviously here too, so he's written very eloquently about these issues. And also the politics, you know, uh, involved with asylum seeking. So, and, I've, and I've been personally pretty cautious about public comments about the politics of it because of I feel that really my expertise is in, is in mental health, but I still feel I have to say these sorts of things. So at the moment we've got a hung parliament, and I think I, I, the figure I had was 67% of Australians, according to opinion polls, support harsher treatment of um, asylum seekers. I'm not sure if that's, a, that's a, the right figure, but it's in that ballpark probably. And um, and I think that's that's just the pure driver of, of, of current government policy. It's about votes, not boats. Totally. And the go current government, lacking confidence in its own authority, sought to buttress its desire to neutralise this issue politically and weaken the wedge driven by the coalition by establishing the expert inquiry. In doing so, I think they hoped to blunt the inevitable critique from the humanitarian sector, and they used the reputations of key Australians as the essential ingredients in this, in this recipe. I don't think there's any doubt about that, not, notwithstanding what those um, respected Australians would themselves say about this. That's, that's, that's certainly the way I, I see it, that they were used in the process. Um, and you know, I think the, the deaths from drowning, that's why I started off by talking about drowning, because this was supposed to be the main sort of plank in the argument. We've got to stop these, un these, these terrible uh, tragedies from drowning at sea. And, you know, that was the higher order evil, in a sense, to be prevented. And so the end justified the means. It was a utilitarian argument, essentially, which I noticed Peter Singer seemed to endorse on, on Q&A one night. Uh, that surprised me quite a lot. A subsidiary moral argument was the unfairness of the predicament of millions of people languishing in refugee camps in regional non-signatory countries. And David's already alluded to that, that, that kind of aspect, that there's, there are a lot, lot of other people in a very bad situation. So that was another sort of um, <clears throat> part of the argument. So this led to what was called, as you know, the, the, no, the no advantage policy, which was really, you can't deny it, trying to seek, a, it's trying to, seek to create a, a deterrence, a degree of deterrence, although they've been very careful to deny a punitive or, or punishment 
you know, component to that. It's, it's, I guess it's semantics, really. Claims were made that the mental health consequences could be minimised. We could pour millions of uh, mental health workers into, into, into the camps and into the detention facilities, and we could, we could moderate the, the mental health effects. Um, and the essence of the argument was the greatest good for the greatest number. So the panel since then, and this, this, is, this is, I may not be totally up to date, but um, they, they, they continually insisted the integrity of the plan had to be respected, that the plan couldn't be criticised um, unless it was implemented in full. But I think what could have been foreseen, and, and uh, it, it's, it's very easy now, some months later, certainly, uh, to see that the government didn't have any capacity to implement most of the plan. And the parts they, they could implement were, the, were going to be the ones that had the, the very negative consequences, especially mental health consequences, and that's in fact what's happened. Um, and without labouring it, I, I suppose what we have seen is that, is that the capacity of the, of the very punitive destinations has been overwhelmed very quickly, with the result that all the, the more recent arrivals have actually ended up you know, on shore anyway and, and are flowing out into community detention. So you've already created a, an advantage policy within, 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 uh, within this new group, an advantage group and a disadvantage group. Well, what, what uh, today's age, um, article in today's age by Eden Paris describes as um, um, just picking out, I forget the actual term that he actually used, plucking people out of a hat to be made examples of is, is what has actually happened. And that's probably also uh, uh, an intended consequence of this, uh, of this policy. So there's clearly a very punitive element. And very quickly, um, um, the conditions that were in place with the Pacific Solution Mark I were recreated very, very rapidly in, in Nauru in particular, in, in Pacific Solution Mark II, with, with um, uh, hunger strikes, deliberate self-harm, and serious suicidal attempts, people hang, trying to hang themselves on a very regular basis. So it didn't take long. All could, have, all could be predicted, and, and so could the, the kind of ubiquitous wave of a new wave of mental ill health in these new detainees. So, I mean, it, it's just uh, um, a very, very deteriorated situation. Um, politically, it seems that the, the, the government's ad adopted the coalition's stance, uh, or has got very close to it. Um, by design, uh, and, and, and maybe it's been successful in, in, in neutralising the political damage from the issue, as they see it. I don't know. Um, but certainly, um, what's that, what that has done, as, as we've seen in the last week, it hasn't actually shut the coalition up on this issue. It's actually forced them even for, further down in, into the gutter on this issue. You know, and I know you talked about this earlier today, that they've got an even more extreme position, which is now this afternoon supported by their leader. So I think the situation, the, uh, the term the race to the bottom has been coined by many people, but we're actually seeing that. We're getting the bottom is even lower than we actually realise. <laughs> so it doesn't look very optimistic to me. The only possible source of optimism that I can see is if the coalition do win the election, there won't be the same political imperative to behave in this way apart from just consistency with what they've said before. But that's about the only possible way out of this that I can actually see at the moment. But um, I'd, I'd bow to the greater political expertise of the people in the audience there. It'd be good to have some discussion about that. So, you know, it's, it's, if you think back to when we were starting to work in this area with, with refugees back in the late 80s, and even well into the 90s, um, it, was a, it was quite a, a positive bipartisan situation where there was support for this sort of work and, and um, you know, the, the positive things of Australia's tradition with, with refugees and humanitarian work was, was very shared and, and, and heading in the right direction. But, but in the last 20 years, we've just seen it just deteriorate further and further. And, and um, all the things we thought might be possible um, are really being eroded. And that's despite you know, a whole range of amazing people working in, the, in this space all around the country and a lot of good work still going on. Um, but um, it's, it's really, um, it's really a, a very uh, sort of pessimistic situation and as uh, was, was reported in the age, it's really a, a scapegoating mechanism that's occurring. Um, the, 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 the scapegoat mechanism, they do describe it quite, quite ni nicely and it's sort of a um, situation where People were a victim uh, who was being scapegoated was was corralled to the edge of a cliff, 
and basically then stoned to death. But everyone in the village was, was doing the stoning. So everyone, but no one was, was, was responsible for it. And the same sort of thing you see in, in firing squads where every, every um, uh, soldier in the firing squad is told he may have the bullet. So there might be six blanks, but, but um, there's, there's one bullet and they're not, they're not really sure which, um, which, which soldier actually did the uh, eventual execution. So it's, it's that sort of sharing of the blame, and, but no one's really responsible. That's quite a nice article if people haven't read, that, read this today, it's quite timely. So if you're thinking ahead, I mean, the reason I, I put the pretty emotive sort of words, uh, words stolen generations into my title is that I can see it's not just about the children, but particularly the children and young people. We just imagine, you know, in, in, in 2050, when we have a royal commission into what actually has happened you know, at, this, at this period of history, I think the same sorts of things will be said about people at this time. The only thing is, I think it's actually a bit worse, because at least this time we know exactly what we're doing. We know exactly what the consequences are. And there's no, you couldn't just say, well, it was just that those were the times and that people were well-meaning and they were trying to do the right thing. Here, there's no, that, that excuse is, is definitely not going to work because everyone knows this is absolutely the wrong thing to be doing in, in, every, in every sense of the word. So, I don't know, it, it, it sounds like, it's an easy sort of thing perhaps to put this sort of argument because, um, you know, it, it's a critique um, and it doesn't really, uh, it doesn't really offer the solution that, that David sort of, is, it was really great to see him striving for that. Um, I think you do have to have faith in people because you think back to 20 years ago, people were were pretty generous, you know, across the board in their attitudes to to, to refugees and and uh, um, people coming to Australia in this sort of way. So I don't think you had this polarisation in those days. So maybe it is possible to get back to that, but we, we've sort of um, cornered ourselves into a very deep uh, ravine. I think at the moment, so I, I, I personally can't see that ha that ha turning around that quickly. But, but um, maybe that's something we could talk about. So I just once again, in closing, just like to thank Robert and, and uh, everyone associated with this forum for uh, allowing me to be part of it and look forward to a bit more discussion and also to hear what Dave's got to say because he's done some sensational work, as you all know. Thanks very much. Thank